Thank you. Um, a very uh, compelling case and a very uh, diverse set of uh, examples here on organizing. We started this morning with uh, Randy telling us community is the new density. So I'd like to start with a question to the panel and I'll just pose it to the panel. Anyone can try to take it on. Um, precarious work exists in many occupations, both professional and non-professional. Is it possible to bring all of the precarious workers together under, under a unifying message? And if so, what would that message be? Guy standing for president. <laughs> the fight for 15. Yeah, fight for 15. But is there a way to bring all of these various, how do we connect all of these different cases? Texas, fight for 15, domestic workers. Is, is, it the, is it the labor movement that tries to bring them together? What, did, what did, would be the connecting string to elevate the voices above themselves? I mean, all of these things I can think of feel not new, but pretty old, actually. I mean, first of all, I think you can't just have one message. You need to have a set of shared principles and values, right? I mean, solidarity forever and an injury to one is an injury to all kind of spring to mind. Those have been around a while. I'm pretty sure I didn't come up with those. Um, but, you know, I think that what that, you know, but what is an injury to one is an injury to all mean in this moment? I don't think we're all looking at, at this world right now from very different perspectives, right? And so actually, um, you know, a graduate student in, you know, who's, who's, you know, focused on math and the standards in their unit, thinking about the history of immigration in this country and the history of slavery is actually really important. Um, so learning each other's histories and having a shared analysis of where we came from and why we're at the moment that we're at so that we have that, shed of, that set of shared values and principles, I think is the only way that we move forward, which is not as fast as one message, but I think it has to be a little bit slowed down to, to, to get us all on the same page. We even see that internally, right, in terms of getting workers on the page from different parts of the country, from different sectors within the domestic work industry, from different language groups. Um, we've been, everyone's been divided for a reason, and it's because it's, we're really powerful when we come together. So, you know, I think that that's, maybe that's the core of it, right? Why don't people want us to come together and what happens when we do? Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? To the microphones, please. She was going to talk about five for 15. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was encouraged. Um, so, I mean, I, I wasn't speaking in just, I actually, I really do think that that's what we're doing um, with the Fight for 15. I believe that we are coming together under a unifying message um, and what we've seen on National Days of Action, but e even in between. In every city where there's a Fight for 15, there's also a coalition table, and at that coalition table are all of the organizations represented here, right, um, as well as um, other organizations that aren't in this room. And so I do believe that the Fight for 15 does represent a unifying message. Um, also, one of the things, one of the questions uh, the moderator asked earlier about organizing multiple employers, um, and I, I didn't touch on it when I was speaking, but it's one of, it's the same, it's the same question. So, like, how do you organize multiple employers when you have um, workers from different sectors? And it's the same thing. You organize the people, and the people push the issues. The people, the workers, lead. Politicians, corporations, they follow, but the workers have to lead. Steve Moser from the Retail Wholesale and Department Store Union. Janice had mentioned that there haven't been too many examples of emerging of social movements with uh, union organizing and union campaigns. We have um, one whole range of success in this area so far. Wish there were more, but we've had 11 elections of car wash workers in New York City, and that's not those, that's a campaign that's been going for a few years. We have won each election by overwhelming majorities. And it's not something that our union has done alone. From day one, it has been a partnership with two other organizations, New York Communities for Change and Make the Road New York. It's been uh, highly successful, but it's very difficult. We're in the process of renegotiating contracts now and, you know, uh, temporary work and a whole lot of issues make it difficult. But I think that's uh, one, one success that we've had. We also started a retail action project, <clears throat> which 
was very much like the organizations that people have been talking about. It wasn't just about wages. It was about a lot of issues and common interests, cultural interests, and you know, it was bringing community together. They have provided a lot of support for campaigns that we've been involved in in terms of retail organizing, and we were successful now. All the Zara workers in New York City, you may not have heard of Zara, but they're bigger than Macy's. They're the biggest retail clothing store in the world, Spanish-based. We, with a lot of action and involvement of international unions and support, we have been able to organize all the Zara workers in New York City. H&M also, a Swedish company. So um, the Retail Action Project focused on scheduling, a lot of issues about precarious employment. Uh, they unified a lot of people, and they've been very instrumental in helping us in those organizing drives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Jeff Wheeler, Department of Labor, International Affairs, AFG shop steward, and an adjunct uh, teacher at Georgetown. So uh, you've hit all the bells here. I just want to follow up on, on a point that uh, Janice made that I think really is a key issue, which is how do we build sustainable dues-paying organizations that are not just based on NGOs that require money from foundations or outside sources? And it, it, it we work on promoting work organizations overseas, and it's the biggest problem. A sustainable dues-based or, dues organization in which workers run themselves. And I'll say, as a union representative of a lot of millennials, they're very good at identifying problems, analyzing problems, communicating in real time, but they're really bad at organizing for action. And sometimes I hear individual examples of workers coming together, but they seem very isolated. And we really lack a critical mass to a sustainable, organized worker voice. So I wonder, how do we get there, is one. Two is, I would just note in all the conversations about wage theft, and I'm thinking back on Kim Bobo's book on wage theft, um, we, the US government has signed all these agreements with other countries, trade agreements in which we agree to comply with labor standards and we enforce our own law. And there's been an argument that's been bubbling up, particularly in Europe, about how the US could be violating the labor chapters of our free trade agreements if workers are not being paid what they are entitled to under the law. So I'm wondering if any thought has been given to that issue as well. Thank you very much for your question and comments. And I, I do want to respectfully push back, I think, on, on two um, two points. The first is that I think that there are uh, folks on this panel who, um, by the work they have done over the last multiple years, would, would challenge the notion that millennials um, are not great at organizing or, or making demands. Um, I'll let our, my colleagues at Fight for 15 speak to that a little bit, but I think there are m multiple examples of that um, out in the country that we see on a daily basis. The second thing is that um, I do think that um, it is important that all of our organizations and that our movement collectively be thinking about revenue generation. Um, I will push back slightly on the notion that the only form of revenue generation that we should be thinking about is, um, is dues, is dues and, and paying dues. That is particularly true um, for those of us who represent incredibly low-wage, uh, undervalued workers um, and, and workers who are an incredibly vulnerable situation. So I, th I just think that we have to be thinking broader than dues as a source of revenue. Um, from our perspective, the Better Builder program has tremendous promise for generating revenue, but I think there are multiple others out there, and we will continue to, to think about those, and I think our entire movement is. Sorry, can I say yeah, a couple? Right okay, um, so just a, a couple of, of reactions. First of all, um, let me make clear, I, I didn't mean to imply that there were no unions that were working together. I was saying there's too few examples. Um, so RWD is one of the trailblazers in this area, I have to say, and I've been writing about RWD for exactly that reason for about 15 years. Um, and, uh, and SEIU has uh, a few examples. Um, and, and also the steel workers and car wash workers in, in uh, but I just wanna say, Jose, um, here's I guess my question back to you would be, um, I think it's really important not to sort of conflate 
income generation, which we need to find a million different strategies for income generation for sustainability, and dues collection, because I think membership, formal membership and dues collection is about um, democracy and participation. And when I was an organizer, which I was for 25 years before doing what I do now, um, we were always taught that it was, um, we should never say that people are too poor to support their own organizations. And that as organizers, yeah. everybody had to, right, it was, about their, it was about their participation, but it was also about their mixing their labor and also their ownership. So, um, membership was about their ownership, right? It was about how we do an action on ourselves, whether people want to feel that they belong and own. So I'm all for our thinking about lots of strategies for income generation, but I feel like membership should not be put in the same basket. So sisterly, brotherly, no, solidarity, I, mean, yeah, I hope it's okay I, to say that, but I course, would love to know what you, what you, what you. What you know, I, I completely agree with that point, and, and I think it's important to make the distinction um, when thinking between the value of, of membership to, um, to buy-in and, and all of those things you talked about and revenue that sustains our movement and allows us to build power. So, um, and again, I, I, this is not to diminish the importance of dues paying uh, as a means to both of those ends, only to point out that we should not be so limited in thinking about it um, for generating sufficient revenue to allow us to build power, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'll just say, I, I, um, just one more thing, Paul, is that okay? Um, let me just say, I, I, partly what I think is it's because we're not asking for enough money. And like, so I think that um, it's possible to imagine if worker centers, I think a lot of the, there are certain worker centers that are starting to ask for more monthly dues. And again, I'm not saying this is by itself the answer, but I think partly the problem is, um, when, when organizations say, well, we just ask for $10 a year or we ask for $50 or $60 a year, that's right. That by itself is not going to be a significant um, uh, rev uh, source of revenue. But I actually think that part of what we learned from the labor movement is that low-wage workers actually can pay higher dues. Um, SEIU, I would point to my friend Jerry Hudson's in the room. Maybe he'd say a few words about this. But right, that um, home care workers are not wealthy workers, right? Child care workers, not wealthy workers. But... Um, you know, if, if you look at what people tithe to their churches and stuff like that, like, you know, people, my experience organizing low-wage workers is that um, they know what it costs, right? And they know what it costs to, to build power and build organizations. So I think that, that we have to we have to figure out how to build sustainable organizations, do that income generation, but also think about how to, how to think about, member, about um, not thinking that membership dues can only be, you know, a, a small percentage. Sorry. Take that suggestion back to our members. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a little bit thinking out loud. This this last exchange I thought was was very interesting. I when I came up here, I wanted to ask about revenue and how you are supported. And within the back of my mind, you know, he who pays the piper plays the tune and. Um, undoubtedly, you're getting sources of funds that are not from the people that you're trying to represent. And that, I think, pre uh, presents a strategic question. How do you move to true representation? Unless I'm wrong about making that observation. But it's been said, you're representing vulnerable workers. They don't have a lot of money. Um, they don't have a lot of money to pay dues. I agree with the last observation that something gives them ownership. It doesn't have to be a lot of dues, but some dues gives them ownership of the organization. So I guess my question is this. First of all, where is your funding coming from? And secondly, do you all have plans, assuming that there are not all membership organizations, to try to move to a form of organization where the people you represent really own the organization by virtue of their membership and their financial contribution? Let me just make two more quick points with, with respect to the Workers' Defense Project um, specifically, and then I can, um, other folks can speak to some of the other issues. I, I want to point out that two things. One, that Workers' Defense Project members absolutely pay dues. Um, but the second important thing to note is that our members are 50% of our board of directors. Um, and so through that process, do have direct control over our organization, our strategic choices, 
um, and the, the broader direction of our organization. So let me, just wanted to make that point as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of diversity in revenue generation and democracy building. I, first of all, I agree with everything that Janice said. So I, I, I think that, you know, there's groups that are doing service provision. There's groups that are aggregating service provision or um, things that are very in, in sectors of people that are hard to reach and where revenue can be generated off that. There's legal services. There's attorney's fees that you can get off doing litigation in areas of ex extreme wage theft. There's Cypre awards that are coming back. So on the legal side, I think there's a lot of innovation. Um, and I think that... I think that worker centers have actually developed quite a lot of experimentations in real ownership and democracy and the militancy of putting your body on the line and striking in innovative ways um, that shouldn't be underestimated. So I think I, I want to say that this is an important conversation to keep having. And I also, though, like don't want to have it land in a dismissive place that worker centers are controlled by outside forces and their members are not really leading, because I think that wouldn't really be accurate when you look at um, the kind of way deep democracy is being built. Yeah, uh, you know, just, just not to be misinterpreted, I, I want to be clear, the brilliance of worker centers was at a time when nobody was organizing, worker centers were organizing, and they figured out an entirely new stream of income to support organizing, which was foundation money. Right, so, um, and foundations, just to be clear, progressive foundations that fund the worker center movement are not dictating their agenda. Worker centers are developing their own agendas and there's no reason why foundations shouldn't be, over the long term, supporting worker centers. And the truth is they have been now for 25, 30 years, right? Um, some worker centers now have been around for a long, long time. So um, the idea is, is to have membership be a piece, but you know, hopefully foundations will continue to support worker centers uh, it's a very good thing that they're doing with their money. And there are labor, I mean, there are unions that are, that are in partnerships that are giving right. money where that like o around new forms of organizing in addition to shared membership. I think that's a really important model that's happening. I think the Lyft Fund, which was on one of Janice's model, which Anna, who's sitting in the back, helped set up is a really good example of where these questions are being addressed. So money is coming in from different sources towards the end of building the labor movement. So I really do think there are a lot of innovations and people in the room that have um, led them and can also speak to them. I just I would say, um, you know, I come out of the worker center movement um, and and have been so grateful to get to be more and more immersed in people who come out of a traditional union model. But I would say talking to leaders from that from that model as well, we're all struggling to figure out what true representation, what democratic control, and what ownership looks like. We're all learning together, right? We have different structures that we were all born into, and we're altering those structures as we go. Um, and this is not a dodge. I I truly believe this. I've heard wonderful things that, union, that, that unions have done to, to build their membership. I love talking to someone who, was, uh, you know, who, who spent 20 years um, slaughtering pigs and is now you know, in, in a high level uh, uh, position at his international, right? That is an important and good story. Um, and I think that there are many, many different ways you can have that representation and ownership and the full participation. So I think for us that are in the C3, we also recognize every format has its limitations right now. Um, you know, so we, we work and make sure likewise um, that our board is um, two-thirds democratically elected from our membership. Um, I think most of the worker organizations are, if not in that direction, moving in that direction. Um, you know, there's other limitations that are put on us, like because we're C3s, we're not allowed to take positions on candidates, right? Um, and, and we're gonna all be under a lot of scrutiny. And that we're all gonna be under a lot of scrutiny, but we're gonna be under a lot of scrutiny um, if, when we don't do that, right? And so we are, it's more important than ever to be working and creative and thoughtful about how we're, how we're working and raising our voices together, but I would just say there's a lot of models out there, um, and, and that deep leadership development in particular, I think is something that I'm really proud of coming out of the worker center model. I think bringing that to scale is really hard, but the, the doing that at the same time and figuring out this question of resources, like once we all figure that out, like we're, we're going to be in a really good position. So we've got a couple years to work on that. So I want to thank, Phil, go ahead. <laughs> I wonder if we could get some comments uh, on how you see the importance of occupational af uh, affinity as opposed to broad scale. I'm with the AFT. Frankly, uh, there was a proposal at one point 
for the AFL-CIO to consider a nationwide associate membership program, we opposed it because our experience is that, uh, and you know, I note uh, the panel representation for domestic worker alliance, construction workers, as opposed to some sort of broad sweep uh, with regard to a successful pathway for movement building. Do you want to? I mean, I'll speak as someone whose organization does represent, um, you know, one sector of the industry that actually, you know, you do a show of hands in our assembly. How many people only work as domestic workers and aren't working in at least one other industry? Mm, few, few people, right? Many of our members are also working in fast food, right? Many of our members are also working, you know, maybe in the, you know, sometimes they're going from one sector within this membership to another. So I think that. There are some ways that we have to dive in and specialize in, in sort of the particular areas that members are working in, especially when they're marginalized, um, because there's particular ways that, that workers have been written out or excluded that you have to be really thoughtful about. But I think we have to be joined together in this moment. There have to be ways to, to join together across occupations. I think Fight for 15 is a great shining example of why. Guest Workers Alliance work across industries is another great example of why. So I think your question is really interesting, though, to think about um, not um, either or, right? Like how do we build solidarity across and between? So Fight for 15 is an example of where a demand um, has resonated. When it comes to actually creating organization, it may be that it's fast food specific and specific by sector, airport, et cetera. Um, it's true that with the worker center networks, the, the growth has been sectorally specific organizations. So. Um, the idea that it's sort of either the CIO or the Knights of Labor, or, you know, um, I think these are old, you know, old discussions. Um, I think uh, I see labor markets where it's going to make sense for people to organize geographically across sector. Um, you know, there's there's examples where that's the way it's going to happen, um, and there are other places where it's absolutely sectoral. Um, I think we have to be open and sort of see what makes sense in specific contexts. I guess. I just wanted to add, I don't think the term global supply chain is not coming up much on this panel, but I think um, not so much as a membership model, but certainly as a strategic model and a campaign model, um, there's a, a lot of potential for co-organizing where the interest and the target is the same um, across warehouse, retail, and manufacturing. Um, and I think that's a really different question than uh, that kind of organizing offers opportunities that shared identity as a contingent or a precarious worker um, alone does not, and, and then allows uh, lifting up of what is the business model and how did this get set up in a way that it turns out in addition, we're all on the Walmart supply chain and actually we're all subcontracted and in four countries freedom of association problems are rampant and the, the, the you know, highest uh, government agency in the country has found continued violations and what are we gonna do about that? And I think similarly on the labor supply chain, um, work there. There are examples of organizations like the National Guest Worker Alliance in the U.S. and also in Mexico, an organization called Prodesk that is organizing migrant workers across sector um, and can organize against recruiters um, who are, uh, you know, who are highly resourced, highly political actors, and interrupt the migration, coerced migration flow. So I think it's a both and. And so, Phil, I I would just add as well you. In, within the DPE, there are a number of affiliates who are in the old guild model, all of the entertainment unions, who are very focused on their sector. And whether it's writers, stagehands, uh, SAG after, which was SAG and after, but is now merged, have been very insular in representing a certain type of worker and, and do it extremely well and haven't branched too far you know, outside of that. Uh, SAG-AFTRA um, has gone from, you know, the movies to TV to commercials to video games to books on tape, but it's all of the work their members do across all of those platforms. And so they've found a niche and they've been around for 100 years and they certainly don't have a problem with, with revenue. So I think there's some of both models that need to be looked at and, and which, you know, which can, can move. Last question. Just, just, just feeding off of this, I didn't really mean to speak. I mean, I represent adjunct union. The adjuncts are in all those sectors. 
Most people think of an adjunct working in multiple universities. They're artists, they're musicians, yep. they're fast food workers because they're artists and musicians. <laughs> and, 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 and some of them belong to multiple unions. So we have some issues, some, we won't belong to your union, we belong to those unions. And, and there's some unifying issues we have to try to solve with that because it makes it hard in the organizing issues sometimes. So we're finished with this panel. Um, I'm, I've, been, I've been getting the hook, but go ahead, oh. quick. <laughs> Um, so, so I just wanted to make um, one observation um, because um, this this question we just discussed is an equally salient question when you try to organize within traditional union structures. All right, the question of how you create sustainable. Um, organization of voice for precarious workers is just as much an issue when you're organizing adjuncts as it is um, when you're organizing in alternate labor forms. And um, one of the things that, that might perhaps we, we might have discussed more in the, in the previous section was you know, the question about do you try to organize union locals that have both tenure track faculty and adjuncts in the same local? Do you try to organize adjunct only locals? How do you deal with the issues that is true of all precarious labor, which is the churn? And, um, and so um, I think it is it's a sign of our seriousness about organizing precarious labor that we actually grapple with these questions to which nobody has a simple, easy answer. Um, take a 10-minute um, a break and we will be back here for the last panel. <laughs>